yourself yet? Okay, hi everyone. Um, I wanted to welcome you to SUNAR's first webinar. And SUNAR stands for the Substance User Network of the Atlantic Region. So welcome. And our first webinar is titled Gender and Sexual I Sexual Diversity and Harm Reduction. And my name is Katie Upham. I use she, her pronouns, and I am SUNAR's harm reduction educator. So before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items to discuss. Um, the event is being recorded and it will be shared on our website and social media within a week. If you are having technical difficulties, what often fixes it is logging out and rejoining. And please use the chat function to introduce yourselves. It would be lovely if you could put a land acknowledgement if you are aware of one for your region and where you're joining us today. And anything else you'd like folks to know about yourself? And we will have time for questions and answers. We would like to save the questions and answers until the end. And if you're able to put the, um, your questions into the Q&A box, we would prefer that. And lastly, I will be providing a link to a little survey so we can get a little evaluation for our presenters um, in the chat after they have finished their presentation. So without further ado, I am happy to turn the webinar over to our regional peer leads, Colton Purchase and Steve Caldwell. Great, thank you, Katie. And hello, everybody. Welcome to Sunar's first webinar. <clears throat> um, I just want to give a little background about Sunar first. Uh, Sunar is the substance user network of the Atlantic region. And this is a project that has been happening for a few years now. And it is mostly around harm reduction and safe supply efforts. We're looking to improve these services for people who use drugs and people with lived and living experience in substance use. Uh, Sunar operates as a network of people across Atlantic Canada. We have eight different sites <clears throat> and we're all coming together to promote harm reduction and safe supply, like I said. So this presentation, I do wanna give a few content warnings. We're going to be sharing memes that are relatively violent in nature, and that's just to highlight the importance of why we need to do this work. There also will be mentions of substance use, as well as suicide, self-harm, or suicide ideation. All right, let me pull this up. <clears throat> and yeah, so I am Colton. I use they, them, and he, him pronouns. And my lovely colleague, Steve, is here as well. Hey, I'm Steve. I use he, they pronouns as well. Um, thanks for having us in the, or being in our space and hopefully everyone learns a lot. All right. Oh, we're a little bit farther behind. Um, I just have to go back. One moment. Sorry. All right, just a moment there. We were just uh, looking through the slides before we started. All right, everyone gets a sneak peek of what's in store. It's great. <clears throat> all right, so first of all, and I think most importantly, we should do a land acknowledgement. And this is a land acknowledgement that we do for Sunar, and it encompasses the different Indigenous groups that are across Atlantic Canada. So I'll start now. As members of Sunar in a virtual meeting, we would like to acknowledge that we are sitting on the unceded and traditional territories of Indigenous peoples. Together, Nova Scotia, PEI, New Brunswick, and Newfoundland and Labrador are traditionally called Mi'kmaq. Our members in Nova Scotia and PEI are situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. In New Brunswick, we are sitting on the land of the Wulastuyik, otherwise known as Maliseet or Mi'kmaq. We respectfully acknowledge Newfoundland or Oktahumguk in Mi'kmaq uh, as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and the Beotuk. We recognize the Inuit of Nanatsiavut, the Inuit of Nunatukavut, and the Innu of Nitasinin and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we may care for each other in our own way 
to try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. <clears throat> Steve, would you like to do the safer spaces statement? I did that Zoom thing where I started speaking on mute. So now it's an official meeting uh, workshop. <laughs> so uh, safer spaces statement. This is uh, something we read every time to ensure a safe space for everyone, um, for lived experience, LGBTQ plus and everyone else. Um, in this space and in all interactions with members, we'll treat each other with respect, dignity, regardless of age, race, gender expression, gender identity, sexual orientation, levels of ability, and all diverse identities. Everyone entering the space has a responsibility to uphold these values. Sunar is committed to and encourages all those to gather with us to speak from personal experience, avoid speaking on behalf of others, try to use I statements to share reactions or experiences such as I feel I'm affected by, don't make assumptions about others' identity or experiences. Be mindful of how long and often we speak so that everyone has a chance to contribute. Listen to each other so we understand the various perspectives. Share beliefs, opinions, and points of view rather than judgments. Maintain confidentiality. Information shared here should stay here. And we also be mindful of the pronouns of others and use them. Uh, it's okay to ask if you don't know. That's how we learn together. And we are here in the space to grow, to connect, and share our experience, knowledge, and light in the space. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> All right, first, I'd like to talk about pronouns. Um, why are they important? What are pronouns, first of all? So pronouns are a way for us to address each other without using our names. Pronouns usually reflect somebody's gender identity, but could it could also not be the case sometimes. Um, so using pronouns, um, how can they help? It really helps to be able to address a person respectfully and in the way that they would like to. Um, it shows respect, it shows that you care, and it can be a way for someone to feel safe. And who do they matter to? They matter to everybody, um, even people who are cisgendered and heterosexual. Using proper pronouns um, is what makes people comfortable. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about gender identity, gender expression, and a few other things mentioned in the gender unicorn. So gender identity is how you feel on the inside. It is the way that you think, it is the perspectives that you have, and it can reflect either a binary gender, like male, female, or it can re uh, represent something different or something outside of that regular binary, being gender queer, being non-binary, being uh, trans, things like that. So our gender identity, like I said, is how we feel on the inside. Um, personally, I am a gender queer person. I identify more in the non-binary spectrum, but as the next thing is gender expression, I might not have that androgynous look, you know, that, that people kind of assume that happens with non-binary people. So a gender expression is how you portray yourself on the outside. Um, in our society, we have different markers that show masculine and feminine traits. And using those uh, markers, we can portray ourselves in a way that makes us feel comfortable and to show the world that we have a different expression. <clears throat> So the gender identity and gender expression is based upon yourself. It's based upon how you feel and how you want to put yourself out in the world. Sex assigned at birth is something that we, most of us have received. Um, we are either given male or female, um, sometimes intersex. <clears throat> and that is based usually upon genitalia and um, yeah, based upon genitalia. Somebody who identifies with the sex they're assigned at birth is known as cisgender, and somebody who doesn't um, is known as trans. And being trans is an umbrella term. It doesn't necessarily mean that you are a trans male or female. Being trans also encompasses non-binary and genderqueer folk. <clears throat> so also on the gender unicorn, we have physical attraction and emotional attraction. And this is more for the asexual and aromantic um, type people. So being physically attracted to somebody is very much that, having that physical, physical attraction, um, sexual attraction, things like that. And that is based upon your sexuality. Being emotionally attracted to somebody can be different. You could be emotionally attracted to a different gender. Um, and that is more around our romantic side. So people who are aromantic, for example, don't necessarily feel that emotional attraction to others. 
Next, I want to talk a little bit about HRT or hormone replacement therapy. And I think this is a great way to tie in harm reduction work, as well as providing a, a safe and positive space for queer people. So in many harm reduction and uh, safe supply places, they have needles, they have supplies that um, fortunately really help people with HRT. Um, people with HRT, they, they inject, sometimes they inject testosterone or testosterone blockers. And <clears throat> it can be really life-saving for people to be able to you know, um, use the proper hormones that they think would fit amongst themselves. So this is important for harm reduction organizations because we have many people come through our doors, um, multifaceted um, things, uh, intersecting oppressions and things like that. So it's that much more important for us to be able to provide a space for people, especially queer people, when they're um, going through and receiving some of these supplies. And just so, to touch on what Colton said, I think like one of the ethos of harm reduction is meeting people where they're at. And that means including all people, inclusivity and being aware beyond yourself. Like having other thinking makes you an ally. So I completely agree with that. Yeah, thank you, Steve. And I also wanted to end note this one by saying HRT isn't necessarily harm reduction. Um, there's not an inherent harm being done or anything, um, but it does require many of the same supplies. So it's really important for us to be cognizant of that. All right, next, um, we're gonna talk about creating queer positive environments. So this can look like multiple things. Um, and sometimes it just takes a small little change that can really show somebody um, that we care and that this is a positive space for them and that they can be their authentic selves. So things like putting up queer art, um, using your pronouns in, in your email signature, um, displaying LGBTQ plus educational materials, having queer people on staff, you know, um, and a lot of people that do harm reduction work, building rapport with your clients is a very important step. And being able to build rapport with people based on your own lived experience, say, if you also identify as a queer person, it can really make that building rapport and building a relationship that much easier. I know myself, when I've went into harm reduction organizations or any type of support, if there is a queer person on staff, I gravitate towards them. <clears throat> um, and also, happy Pride to everybody. I just want to say that this is our last day of June, um, last day of Pride. I know that some provinces in Atlantic Canada, like myself in Newfoundland, the Pride events don't start until July, but internationally, um, Pride is in June. So happy Pride to everybody. And that's another way for us to be able to um, be included or show up in a positive queer environment is to go to Pride, you know, go meet people where they are, like Steve was saying. <clears throat> So that being said, I did want to talk a little bit about Pride and how it's currently being monetized. Um, <clears throat> it's one thing to show up to Pride and you know have a rainbow and all of those things, but it's another thing to be donating, to be supporting, to be creating space for queer people. That's where the real value comes. Um, it's great to have rainbows and show representation, but taking that extra step and being able to include queer people in decision-making tables, as well as the ground level work, I think is the most effective in creating a positive and safe environment for people. All right, next, Steve is gonna talk a little bit about heteronormativity. Yeah, I'm Colton, thanks for pushing the buttons for me and doing the slides. Um, so yeah, heteronormativity is something that has affected my life and I'm 39 years old. And I often tell people I'm like four years old because I got a lot of therapy and a lot of help and I had queer allies in rehab and queer allies um, just in personal therapy. I have queer allies as friends and I came into myself through a world that I had to exist in that was inherently against my every fiber. Um, I have a big beard like that's how I look like Colton and I were talking about, you know, how we present ourselves. And with that, a lot of things happen where that's just who I am. I'm a beard, I'm a, I'm a masculine man. I'm whatever masculine is, that's something else to unpack as well. Um, so within therapy, one of the questions that really helped me within this looking into the heteronormative world was what does it mean to be a man? And that like shell shocked me. Like I was staring at my feet for quite some time and it took a really good ally and another person of the queer community who has a counseling background to start looking and unpacking 
all of the things I've been going. So, so heteronormativity <laughs> is the assumption that heterosexuality is the default. And it's not for everyone, just as a heads up. Um, preferred or normal state for human beings because of the belief that they all fall into one or another category of a strict gender binary. And just touching on like that, I felt like I was walking my feet in a direction that was totally not mine and for other people. So finding out that this is okay to be who I am and have allies beyond the binary is like getting skin again on, you know, being able to stand in the storm. So it involves further assumption that the biological sex and sexuality and gender roles are aligned. Such assumptions marginalize lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. And that's from the Dictionary of Social Work and Social Care by John Harris and Vicki White. Next slide, please. There we go. Yeah, so like if you've been on Facebook, which a lot of us know about, unfortunately, you probably ran into some memes. And I often think memes are some of the worst ways to pass information around. It's spread like wildfire. It doesn't need to have evidence. It's emotionally charged pictures. And they're often adopted by people trying to take a slice off another person. Um, some far right you know, mission or some kind of hateful or comparison thing. Um, one of my favorite philosophers, Rumi, says comparison is a thief of joy. And I really don't want anyone's joy stolen or people to be harmed. So um, the message behind this meme, it's, it's about D-Day. It says 1944, 18-year-olds storm the beaches, charge into almost certain death. 2015, 18-year-olds need a safe space because words. I mean, I have been cut down by words from family members, from teachers, from people who are supposed to be in healthcare, who are have open doors for everyone apparently, that have really taken my life into different harmful directions. And to compare that to, you know, being tough is really, you know, telling people the LGBTQ community they're weak. And that's not something that is a fair thing to do. Um, on top of that, I mean, even within Fredericton, uh, recently I was at a great, um, presentation, historical presentation about a queer couple from World War I. I mean, there's lots of gay soldiers out there that fought for the country too. So just in general, it's historically inactive as well. But this is the motive for some people within the heteronormative community to make others feel unusual, othered, or not, you know, equal. Next slide. Uh, another one's whose life is at risk. Um, another thing I see a lot is like, oh, it's Pride Month. I got to see rainbows for another month. Oh, this is terrible. And from the heteronormative community, it's really a slight and harmful. I mean, if anyone knows about the Stonewall riots and things like that, um, queer people had to fight against police to exist. Um, that's a systematic oppression that's happened, colonization and more against people's just being in general. So for people who have been vulnerable and attacked for just being themselves, for others who have allowed to be themselves 365 days a year in the heteronormative world, it's a real travesty to attack people for having a month to exist, to have activism, to ally, and to just be themselves. So you see a, a trumpet that's on the person's face, and the other people in the heteronormative world apparently just trying to live and that they're being assaulted by queers, which is quite ridiculous and sensationalized in my opinion. Next slide. This one is why we had the warning at the start. Um, these memes matter, they motivate, they send people into places of bias and anger and they put them in the same groups. And within those same groups, I don't know if you know Ryan Spencer or any of the far right, if you see that little frog meme come up named Pepe, that started in some pretty dark channels of the internet. Um, the Charleston um, horrific event that happened, um, all that was connected to you know, Facebook groups and Parler and Telegram and other groups that uh, people unite and come up with far right hateful ideologies and then spread these memes and some people take action and it's terrible. I mean, just recently on the Halifax Harbor front, my wife and I were, my wife, my friend and I, and my baby and my other son were on the Harbor front. 
my wife and my son went into the washroom. I was with my friend and the baby was on my front and somebody made homophobic uh, slurs at me for standing beside my friend with a baby that they did not want to see two men with a baby. So this is very real. Um, anyone that tells you you already have a month, like is, aren't things already right? Or isn't everything already okay with the queer community? Don't you have all your rights? They're not allies and there's a lot to be learned. So a lot of hate groups use these unfortunately and they are spreading. Next slide. So standing up, speaking out, and shutting down. Um, critical does not mean destructive, but only willing to examine what we sometimes presuppose in our way of thinking. And that gets in our way of making a more livable world. So we all have these biases and they come up and it's good to notice them. And going to other queer or LGBTQ folks or people in the community or resources are a good way to look at when the bias comes up, to look into it and to be, you know, looking into your your deep-seated issues that might arise and having a safer pace to look at them so they don't boil into something else and you can be critical of people that are being hateful towards lgbtq folks and that doesn't mean you're being assaultive aggressive or anything like that you're standing up you're being an ally if someone's trying to shut you down and quiet you for being yourself there's usually a reason behind it and some kind of cognitive bias next slide please very well put steve Thank you. Well, I call us a couple of queers. I hope that doesn't offend anyone. Um, I call myself the old queer and, and Colton like the younger queer. Um, he's uh, really helped me or they've really helped me um, with a lot. A lot of like, um, how do I say this? Like I'm still going through a lot. I'm an older queer that's figuring himself out and it's emotional. Like I'm going to cry probably during this presentation a couple of times. I've, uh, I've had myself taken away from me for 30 plus years and just being allowed to have agency over your body, how you label yourself, how you talk about yourself, how you present yourself is very empowering but it's very shaky ground. I haven't stood like this for a long time and it feels good, don't get me wrong, but I needed allies to get where I'm at. So uh, I guess I'll publicly thank Colton for all of his help. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to go this hard. All right, um, so people see what we allow them to see and we hide what we feel may hurt us. I've hidden myself for most of my life. I always help each other open their hearts and eyes together. So I'll introduce myself through my tears in a minute. Let's go to Steve on the board. <laughs> These are trauma laughs, by the way. That's part of it. Whew. So I'm out to some. It's scary for me. I'm from the north end of St. John. Um, even like doing this, like, you know, I have to think in my head, like somebody I know in this meeting that may, you know, I don't want them to tell my family so much. But hey, if, if you are out there, don't out people. It's really cool not to do that. I mean, in a world where everything was great and heteronormativity and, you know, laws weren't against uh, LGBTQ folks around the world, then yeah, that'd be fine. We'd all be great with that, but we're still fighting for equality. So yeah, don't out people. That's a, that's a good way to be an ally. Can you click uh, the next part? Sure. So I put WASP, like white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. I was brought up in um, a church, like my grandfather helped give the land to and stuff and some abuses I really don't want to talk about happened there and uh, fire and brimstone kind of stuff hate yourself um, that wasn't really healthy for me that never really seemed to help at all and uh, yeah so I don't want to I call it Christian guilt like perfectionism be this or you know fit through this door this way don't like go the, any other way there's there's no room for anyone else um, but then Honestly, it's been beautiful watching the church I went to reform. The, we have a new minister. They're um, a lesbian person. They they invited the queer community or LGBT plus community in to criticize the church, the Black African community into um, and the Caribbean community in to uh, criticize the church. Um, they met me, and I won't talk about substance. They met me in a very open area, like just as I was, and it was like almost a very healing moment. Um, I have a far right father, I call him that. I, it's like, a, uh, 
Archie Bunker and Red Foreman wrapped into one. <laughs> it's not healthy. <laughs> like to this day, it's very scary. Like I can't, if I walk in with a pride shirt on, like he snarls at me. Right. And, um, and then tells me he has no problem with the LGBTQ plus community. Like that's as far as he knows. Like I'm, that's as far as I got with him. I wear, I wear a shirt, right. Just cause that's my safety. Thanks for all the stuff in the chat. Um, it's just the way to be. I don't know. I've been given a gift of uh, having a space to be authentic. If it helps somebody else, that's wicked. Wicked also means good to me, just in case. I used to be an ESL teacher. I had to watch that. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so quietly coming out my way. This is probably why I'm crying because I'm working up towards this. Um, I did this artwork with my wife for the CRBC. I think Kirk for, for a lot might be in the room. Thanks, Kirk. Uh, it was a very healing experience to be part of that project and do this artwork. Uh, yeah, so you bring that up. I'll try to bring myself together to read it. That's all good, Steve. You're doing great. Thanks. Um, Thanks. Let me know if you can see it. I can see this. Okay. Through blurry eyes. So yeah, it's called Dissipating Hate. And my wife did this. Um, it's actually based off Jay Simpson's artwork. Um, really amazing um, indigenous author. So yeah, it's a painting we did. Um, you see words of hate raining down on the person who feels alone. And then my poem is underneath the rainbow um, with family that keeps me going. All right, I got to take a little sip of water. Time out. Thanks for letting me use your office, Carolyn. It's lovely. I like it here. Whew. All right. Uh, a sailor's son, my dad's a sailor. A measure of a man, water washes over me. It's the only thing that keeps me from drowning. Suffocating screams stay in my head, silent for everyone but me. Safeguarded by apron strings in a palatial paradise that pains my skin, my mother is a beautiful person. Whirling around in a kitchen of care, creating loved expression always oh, there. Slam, click, thump, his steps quicken, and a tongue lashes out labels, queer, fruit, and eyes roll like fists. Enough jabs to leave me bleeding. A matriarch sewing men's where she can. A safe space created from chaos of chaos and control in a patriarchal pur purgatory. An empathetic embrace. Rowing through woes with a woman full of love. Somehow surviving misogynistic matters while wearing a fashionable smile. Always an ally, letting lighten the loafers me dance freely. Picking pansies with mama's dandy. Safer spaces are people, humanity. Saltwater streams down my cheeks, born next to the sea. Healed, cleansed, and free. Drawing strength from perceived inadequacy. So yeah, that was just a poem mainly about like my biggest allies my mom I mean without her you need like one good person in your life she may not understand all the stuff at a level we're talking about it here but she understands hearts and she understands help and she understands what harm is like so yeah um, next slide I don't know where I'm at right now almost <laughs> yeah Steve, I really enjoy that poem as much as you can enjoy a poem about, you know, hurt and um, being pressured under parental figures, but it always moves me. And I just want to say thank you for sharing that. It, uh, it very much shows your, your vulnerability. Yeah, and thank you. I wasn't given vulnerability. I was just a victim of everything until I had good therapists. Vulnerability is like a really big gift to give another person validation and really return life to them. It's possible. It's really possible. Uh, next slide. That's it for me. I think it's now your turn. And I, oh no, I'm not done. Oh, great. These are all the people that saved my life. I forgot about that for a second, which is really terrible. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, RM Vaughn, um, amazing writer, poet, um, unfortunately no longer with us. Um, I won't talk much about substances, but I was off my head for a long time. And for somebody just to like 
be that dude at the party just to like sit with you and keep you safe and like listen to you cry about how much you hate yourself and to know why you do authentically it's a gift i that person was in so much pain but they helped everyone they're so beautiful and they did not need to go down the way they did and i thank them every day like doing this presentation would not happen without their, their honor and their grace cecil kerfont with the little thinking his mouth there like reed or little timothy hay or whatever uh that's my counselor he's now my friend we're outside the fiduciary relationship we went through all the proper channels um he just took somebody who was crawling through a door and hating themselves for most of their life and coming up with these coping mechanisms like everyone thought i was the happy funny guy like no <laughs> no i'm in a lot of pain uh, I just don't want you to see it because it's not safe for me for you to see it or it's not safe for you to know why. So he helped me figure that stuff out and I'm really grateful for that. Um, Sean Payne, Nate Caldwell, and myself, that blue picture, they've been through like everything with me since I was in elementary school. Like it's ridiculous how long. They've stayed the course. Next picture in the little mirror thing, that's also Sean Payne and then my wife in the middle. Um, we might look like a heteronormative couple, but I'll tell you we're not <laughs> and uh thankful for somebody who gets it because um i've i've come through a lot and people who have been traumatized will test you will test to see if you're safe and especially if anything with you know lgbtq plus stuff on top it just adds another layer of stigma that's possibly there so yeah and then at the bottom i just have people um from pop culture and in media like if they're not around then it's just another you look around, you're like, oh, not, nobody's like me. So I am, I am uniquely effed up. I'm a freak, Jesus. Like I, or I shouldn't say that, but I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be in this place. But then you see David Bowie, and you're like, oh, I can jive to that. And, you know, put on a song and start, you know, put on some different clothes or makeup or whatever. Like, if it feels right and it's not hurting anyone and it's intrinsically you, seeing somebody else in the culture or in pop culture who has made it through the same trials and tribulations is like a savior. Whether people get out, if you don't get it, that's okay. It saved me. Um, that's it. That's it for me. I hope you know all those people at the bottom there because they're amazing. All right. Um, I'm going to talk about myself next. <clears throat> so on my picture, it says still figuring it out. And I very much mean that. I think that my journey and uh, many people's journey through their own gender identity and sexuality is a lifelong process. You know, um, <clears throat> I originally came out as gay. I now identify as pansexual. I identified as cisgendered most of my life, but right now I identify as a genderqueer non-binary person. And <clears throat> it has been a process um, through acceptance, through um, looking at myself, through reflection, and of course, um, being around like-minded people. So I'll talk a little bit about my past as well. Um, and some of this is a little difficult to talk about, but. Um, kind of like Steve, um, I believe that sharing these stories and being able to um, relate to other people can really help us. You know, there's solidarity in the struggle. <laughs> um, so first I'll talk about my small town upbringing. I'm from Newfoundland and in central Newfoundland, it's known as the Bible Belt. Um, there was one convenience store, but there was five churches in my town. So there's a lot of Christian influence and I'm not... Um, yeah, I'm not saying anything about Christianity in a negative sense, but the influences and the biases that I was told growing up really affected me. Um, being in such a small town, I felt isolated. I didn't know of any queer people. I genuinely did not know of a single queer person. And looking back in retrospect, that contributed to, you know, that feeling of isolation. Um, I was also bullied a lot. I was called the F slur. I was called gay and queer before I even knew what it meant, you know, as, as a small kid because I showed emotion, because I enjoyed things that are quote unquote inherently feminine. And that really affected the way that I saw myself growing up and the things that I felt I should be interested in and the things that I shouldn't be. Another thing is social services. Um, where I'm from, uh, child senior social development as it's called in Newfoundland um, is pretty much the only aspect of social services that we see in central Newfoundland. Um, there wasn't a gay straight alliance in my school. 
there wasn't anything that I could have as an outlet or as a network to be able to talk to people who were in the same boat as me. And that, of course, contributed to the isolation and, you know, not understanding um, the world around me, really. I know looking back that if I had more social services, if there was a social worker that I could have talked to during my high school experience, maybe things would have been a little bit different. But I just wanted to highlight the importance of um, having that in, in smaller communities. <clears throat> Next is my coming out story. Um, I came out to my parents after being attacked, um, physically attacked by a group of people. And it wasn't taken that well. So my um, coming out story isn't, isn't a positive one. It's pretty stark, it's pretty dark. And um, it was hard to, to accept that sometimes and to, to claim that as, as my own. Um, microaggressions were a really big thing growing up. Um, people told me that I should kill myself. Um, people told me that they don't understand why I am the way I am and things like that. And that really affects somebody when they're young and when they're, you know, very impressionable and looking to come into their own identity. So I have acceptance there and acceptance was a big thing for me. It took a lot for me to accept myself as a non-heterosexual cisgender person. I fell into self-harming. I fell into drugs. I had multiple attempts at suicide because I felt that my existence was wrong, that I shouldn't be here. Um, and that that's not the case, you know, everyone deserves to have a fulfilling life, no matter what your sexual preference or gender identity is. <clears throat> so I'm getting a little choked up here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> next, I wanna talk about heteronormativity and lack of representation. I mentioned before that there really wasn't any queer people where I was growing up. Um, and, it was really difficult. Like I said, I felt like I was the only person in Newfoundland who was queer, which is you know, obviously not the case, but that was my reality. I, I felt very um, outcasted. Um, one of the first times of queer representation in the media that really struck home with me, and I'll forever preach it, was Katy Perry's Fireworks song, where there is a scene where a boy comes up and kisses another boy. I remember sitting in my room on my iPad, or my iPod touch and just, you know, ugly crying because I didn't realize that this is something that I shouldn't be ashamed of, that this is, um, it's positive. It's something that I couldn't accept myself for. And just having that representation meant the world to me, just, just from a simple music video, you know? <clears throat> Next, um, my topic is called a safe place. So I had to leave my hometown due to homelessness and um, substance use, and I needed social services. That's why I talked about social services earlier, because I was in, I was in need of help. I moved to the capital city of Newfoundland, which is St. John's, and I got tied into an amazing organization called Choices for Youth. Throughout Choices for Youth, I was able to access their um, emergency housing shelter, multiple, multiple supports. I could sit here all day and name off the different programs I've attended. But one of my main things was that I was involved with their Youth Leadership Council, which is a council of youth with lived experience who like to advocate for better services within the organization as well as outside in our community. So one of the big things for me and recognizing that I was in a quote unquote safe place was accepting and embracing my lived experience. I was personally ashamed of all the things that I've went through of, you know, the physical, emotional violence that I endured, um, even down to my own self harming, like I was very ashamed of those type of things. Being involved and being in a community of people with lived experience changed my life. Genuinely, it was a place where I could feel that the things I went through could be useful tools in, you know, creating change and promoting better living, better living, living uh, circumstances for people. Um, within that, I found community. I have friends today throughout that council who um, I love to death that we have stuck together. Um, they're, you know, my rock type people. I can go to them. They understand, you know, and that's, I think, is the the most important thing about creating spaces for queer people is that we can relate to each other and there is real strength in community. <clears throat> Safe spaces are also there. Um, that's really important to me too. I have um, founded an organization called Heart to Heart NL and that is something that operates in Newfoundland and Labrador and it's for youth. It's 
lived experience based and we promote youth voice and lived experience that's our big thing and we provide safe spaces for people to be able to excuse me um reach out to peers um share share our stories and things like that without judgment without you know um yeah just without judgment <clears throat> and that is me All right, next, we're gonna talk about microaggressions, um, specifically how microaggressions relate to bigger things in society. A microaggression can be anything from a look, a word, a physical action, um, just even having your own perspective against a group of people. They're usually negative, um, but microaggressions point that there are prejudices and stereotypes at play. There's a reason why people, um, do microaggressions, it's because they think and they believe the stereotypes and prejudices that are within groups of people. <clears throat> so when there are uh, prejudices and stereotypes, um, those are those are beliefs that people have. And in terms of like government and higher up powers, they're people too. And when those people have prejudices and stereotypes against the group of people and they have the decision-making power, they're not going to be um, creating safe and positive spaces for people. They're gonna be perpetuating the disenfranchisement of the queer community, of other communities, and, and likewise. <clears throat> so there's a few things here, just as a, a check yourself type thing um, in terms of microaggressions. So don't assume one partner is the man and the other is the woman in queer relationships. Unless somebody identifies as a man and the other person identifies as a woman, it's not going to be a man and woman relationship. And I think it's something for us to really challenge is what the gender roles of a relationship are and what the expectations are. <clears throat> um, next is referring to LGBTQ as a choice or lifestyle. It's not. <laughs> um, it's been proven that it is inherited through genetics. Three is asking invasive questions about someone's body, like what parts do you have down there? Um, my general rule is unless you are romantically or sexually interested in somebody, and even in that sense, it's still, it's none of your business, you know? It's a very intimate thing, what, what we have. Um, they're called private parts for a reason. <clears throat> um, for this one very much relates to myself, um, especially, telling someone that they don't look non-binary, people don't owe you an expression that aligns with their identity. People have multiple different identities, or sorry, have multiple different expressions, and they can fluctuate based on their identity. Like myself today, I have a t-shirt and I'm wearing, you know, I have my beard. Um, I'm not wearing makeup right now. So people would probably assume that I'm male, which is okay. Um, I just know that my identity deep down is not male. So that that's me as a person. Um, and five is assuming a queer person can't relate to straight people. We all grew up in a heteronormative world. We're very aware of, you know, how it goes, how it is. My half of my life, I lived as a, a straight uh, cisgendered person. So we can definitely relate. We, we understand to a degree. <clears throat> Next, we're gonna talk about the word queer. Yeah. Um, I love this word and I've reclaimed it for myself. I mean, some people may not feel they want to do that. That's for their choice. If somebody's using it as a slur against you. That's obviously a different motivation. Um, I also reclaim the one that starts with an F, but I don't want to say it in front of people because it might trigger them. But when I stand in the face of a fascist or in the face of a far right person, I'm kind of proud to be a big queer ally and I will use the other word as well to denote that I'm not fearful of them and the slurs that they've used to try to damage me are actually something that I throw back at them with pride. So yeah, uh, queer sounds kind of weird. It's uh, something that people in politics, like I think of Reagan, a bunch of queers, he said that once, um, to denote that they're weird, they're freaks, you don't wanna trust them you know, around your kids, all that kind of stuff. That stuff's in the media and it's really portrayed. Even the PPC party, um, in St. John, um, somebody made fallacious, totally salacious lies up about a drag uh, library event, which my friend was part of, and they've had to deal with death threats and many other things because of that. 
None of the things were happening. They posted a picture of a G-string with money on it, which was a, from a completely different event, not related to it all, and posed it like it was happening at the St. John Public Library. This is happening in your communities, and it's very important. So queer is a word that describes sexual and gender identities other than straight, and cisgender, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. People may all identify with the word queer. Some people don't. Um, there's a lot to that. Um, but if you want to just go to the next part, Colton. Yep. So we have the LGBTQ explained. We're going to watch a video in just a second. Um, but also there's a lot of artwork that comes with the queer community. And can you go back for just one sec there, Colton? Sorry. Yep. There we go. Um, down there, um, there's some artwork that's actually from like the HIV AIDS movement in the 80s. And then also there's Stonewall down there. I encourage anyone to look up the history of Stonewall. Um, and also the artists over the right showing compassion and communities, Keith Haring, um, the, the red artwork there. Both of those people are key, or sorry, Keith Haring's a key ally. And the event, the Stonewall event, would really help others, maybe who don't completely understand what we're saying or you know, don't have to deal with these issues, to really look into it to understand how the history is formed and how why it's still important to have activism and allies. Um, yeah, if you want to open that video now that explains the LGBTQ2SIA, that would be great. This is from San Diego, but I still find it relevant and it's good. It's a good wrap up and helps it be palpable for a lot of people. Um, hold on. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah, we're, we're not getting any sound right now, Katie. She's working on it. They got it. Celebrating Pride with dozens of events this week, and as we continue to celebrate our LGBTQ plus community, we take a moment to reflect on the acronym's meaning and the importance of acknowledging identities. Newsday Savvy also reports on how one word used to change over the years and how it's now being celebrated. It's Pride Week and we are celebrating LGBTQIA2S+. We're going to talk about the meaning behind each letter in that acronym, specifically Q, LGBTQIA+. All of those letters just signify a person who is non-heterosexual or non-cisgender. The acronym is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning or queer, intersex, asexual or ally, and now 2S, which means two-spirited, used by indigenous people to describe their sexuality or gender, and plus encompasses inclusivity. Every time we add on a new letter, every time we add on a new part to this acronym, what it's essentially saying is, we see you for who you are. But now the letter Q and its meaning queer has evolved over the years. What was once used as a derogatory word is now embraced by younger generations. Evan Johnson with Trans Family Support Services once studied linguistics and explains its meaning today. So when I use queer, I use it twofold, right? It takes away the binary and it also is a word of safety for me. But for older generations, the word queer can sting. It's easier to be queer when you're younger. The older generation, they went through so much to get where they are, so we need to also respect where they have come from. Air Force veteran Victor Polito served during Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and remembers the word queer was not used kindly. Even when I was serving in the military, I heard that a lot. But now younger generations are proudly calling themselves queer. That's good right there, Kate. That's great. Of taking language. You just stop it there. That's fine. Um, so yeah, basically, there's still a lot of mm, allyship that needs to happen within the queer community at times. And since the heteronormative world is so divisive, there's still a lot of conversation that has to happen around this and a lot of allyship that has to happen. I think the most important thing is that we listen to other people and we meet them where they're at and we find words and ways to learn their language and their expressions so that we don't overwrite their experience causing more harm. Being an ally is being an active listener and having an awareness that isn't for you, it's for the other, an awareness outside of yourself. So yeah, I just wanted to explain the acronym for some that uh, may not know it as well, and there's lots of great resources out there. You can go to the next slide. And then click one more. Okay, thank you. I was a little lost for a second. Right. Um, so awareness is an ally. Um, if we have all been socialized to have certain uh, biases and prejudice, then we are capable of enacting those biases in our words and our actions. I mean, Colton's talked about how he lived, you know, as a straight person in the heteronormative world. Like I did too. And I realized that I was living against myself 
And through that living against myself, I lived against others in the queer community. I hated myself so much for who I was because of the way I was taught and what was going against my core feelings. So I became almost like shattered glass. Um, I would cut myself with words. I would self-harm and things like that. But I didn't mean to be putting these biases on other people in the queer community that were out living more you know, authentically. It's because I couldn't do that yet. I was scared. I was fearful. And within fear, there's a lot of hate. And to stop the spread of hate and ending that harm, I had to find love. And it was like, even just saying that makes me want to cry because I know love now. And it is a very powerful and beautiful force on the other side of fear. Fellowship is not based on fear. Fellowship is based on unconditional understanding and radical acceptance. That's what we're here to present today, but with an LGBTQ plus uh, vibe to it. Um, so question memes and their sources and ask before sharing, please, because you could just be spreading hate like wildfire and not know. They're, it's very crafty, very calculated. It's supposed to be palpable to you. So you jump on it, you grab it, and you throw it without thinking to somebody else. Uh, visit LGBTQ plus websites for resources. Listen and learn. You can use and learn pronouns and think beyond your own experience. If you make a mistake, apologize and just readdress it and try it again. Don't make it your validation. Like, oh, I've, I messed up the pronoun. I'm a terrible person. No, like that's not what we're looking for. Like we're already going through all these harms and stuff. Just apologize and try. Next. So I brought up some of these because I found them quite interesting because they're like some of them I've heard directly. So if you're gay, these are like microaggressions or you know, even more than a microaggression. Um, if you're gay, don't tell me I'm not ready yet. As if me being myself makes it hard for you to exist. I don't know why that had to happen. Oh, wait, it didn't. We could just be ourselves. You could respect me and my sexuality, my gender expression. I can do the same for you. No problem. We're good. All right. So my friend, awesome. Uh, but you don't look queer. Um, we get this one a lot. I think Colton mentioned it and I get this one a lot. I look probably the way I do because I didn't want to get beat up or like attacked anymore. You know what I mean? Like eh, I, I can fit in with the big beard and stuff. Like even in places I've worked, they're like, go talk to those guys. Like you you fit in with them better. I, I fucking, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to swear. My apologies. I don't fit in with them well. I am scared of those men because I've been traumatized by men who look like them. So I tried to look like them so I don't get traumatized by them anymore to an extent. But you're telling me I fit in with them when I don't even fit in with them in the first place. And it's a trauma response going there. So thank you for knowing me better than I know myself. I don't look queer. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, what looks queer? There's no, there's no checkbox for that. Next one, Colton. I like how you know my rants now. You're good at this. You're just going. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the uh, F-bomb. I did not mean that one. I meant to say fellowship. Um, dude, I totally forgot you were gay when we played ball earlier. So now sports are out of the equation. We can no longer play basketball. I'll be down at this other hoop. You'll be down at that hoop. And then maybe we can talk some other time. Um, you know, it doesn't make any sense. All of our hobbies and activities are, you know, still the same. We still are the same person that you loved. Nothing's different there. We're going to respect your boundaries as well. Next. And yeah, I think this is you, Colton. Yeah, so I just want to say thank you everyone for attending. Um, this is the biggest group that we've had with this presentation yet, and I'm very excited. Um, and I feel great that we were able to do this. <clears throat> so we want to open up the floor to a few questions. And I see in the Q&A that we do have a couple. I did answer one of them. Um, somebody had asked why my pronouns are they, he, and Steve's are he, they. What's the, what's the difference? And that's just based on our own preference. Um, I know that pronouns aren't preferred, but I do personally have a preference um, using they, them pronouns, but I also don't mind he, him pronouns. So that's the reason why. Cool that Colton brought that up because it's like something I'm literally just getting into recently. Like, again, I call myself the old queer because this isn't something that was available to me. And it does help me identify myself better. And I could see myself actually switching them as I become more comfortable. It's it's like a push and pull thing just because of the trauma I've been through. So it's a, it's a very strange thing. Thanks for mentioning that. That's a good question. Yeah, of course. Um, did we want to read out the other two questions? Um, did you want to read them? I think one of them really um, pertains to you, Steve. Oh, okay. I don't, 
I hang on. <laughs> okay, I can I can read it out if you want. Yeah, because I'm yeah. still a little spun after the poem. Sorry. Of course. So Tabitha asks, "How do you start to reconcile being a queer person while in a heterosexual relationship?" Um, they do have that in quotes. Where yeah. you present to the world as quote straight person. This is something I struggle with because part of me feels like I have no right to be part of the community slash talk to it when I don't have anything to hide per se. I hope this question makes sense how I wrote it. Yeah, I, I hope my answer makes sense. I'm just going to like organically answer it how I see it and you can readjust me. I feel like you're always going to fit the community and the community doesn't let you fit, then that's a problem with the community itself. Like, you know yourself, you know how you identify and you know your preferences and sexuality. So, you know, you're part of the community. I just, I feel like I could just say that. Um, secondly, how do I reconcile it? Um, I almost like wanna look up the word reconcile right now. Um, certain people are allowed to know who I am. Certain people aren't. That's how I deal with it. I mean, Colton knows I'm queer. Carolyn knows I'm queer. Katie knows I'm queer. You guys all know I'm queer now, but, uh, you know what? We're totally heteronormative when I'm at my folks' place. It's just easier that way. Um, but if we're out, you know, with certain friends or partying or whatever we're doing, like we can, with this that closed in like safe space that we've created, we can totally be ourselves. Um, yeah, I guess we're just selective about showing ourselves, unfortunately. That's the best way I could say it until the world changes to be more allied with everyone. I'll put. Um, next, we have Marlene. Marlene says, I am early in my transition, female to male, he, him. I found the WPATH assessment process traumatizing because the assessor required that A, all my trauma was fully resolved, and B, that I have no substance use issues. I lied just so I could get my letter. Can you speak about the gatekeeping and stigma baked into the WPATH process? I don't know if I can hit, do that one personally as well. I don't know if you can Colton handle that. Yeah, um, Marlene, I just want to say, like, I apologize. I don't know much about the WPATH process. Um, I do know um, in Newfoundland, in my experience with friends who are trans, um, they had to, to jump through hoops type thing to get their HRT, to be able to get their gender markers changed and things like that. So um, I can't speak too much about into the gatekeeping, but there certainly is stigma that people are supposed to look a certain way, act a certain way, or have some underlying conditions that allow them to be accepted as, you know, um, male or female or trans or gender yeah. non-binary. One of my friends just said that the paperwork, like I can't speak to it either, but I can only speak from my friend's experience and I won't name them that the paperwork was tragic. The, you know, using their dead name, uh, wrong sex like everything was just gender expression everything was just tragic when it came to paperwork and formalities and lack of understanding of the language and trauma-informed care that had to happen that was my experience or their experience sorry i'm sorry hey, next uh next we have kim um kim says can you share about neo pronouns i would like to understand more to support our clients um, I can I can talk a little bit about that. So neo pronouns are something that aren't around the typical he, her, um, and they pronouns. Um, for example, Z and Zier, or G and Zier, which is uh, Z E or X E. Um, people like to use different pronouns because it is a way for us to label ourselves that um, shows more accuracy around who we are. Um, Neo pronouns are something that I'm not the most familiar with. I don't use neo pronouns myself, but I do have friends who use them. And it's just like any other pronoun. It doesn't necessarily lean towards your identity, that, but it is definitely a great way for us to be able to portray to others that we aren't cisgendered or heterosexual. <clears throat> um, I hope I answered your question okay, Kim. Um, next we have, oh, a question for myself. <laughs> what advice or recommendations do you have for other young folks who grew up in smaller rural communities like in NL, who may be queer and looking for connection? Um, that is a really good question. Um, I grew up, like I said, in a small community where there really wasn't anything. I know that in Newfoundland and Labrador, um, it is legally mandated that if one student wants to have a GSA, which is called a Gay Straight Alliance here, the school has to provide the funds, the space, and the support for that. So look into um, schools, look into the legislation around how schools support queer people, and that person could potentially start up their own GSA. As for, you know, not taking on that load of work, because that certainly is a lot of work, 
Um, there are different ways to connect with queer people. Like in Newfoundland and Labrador, we have my organization, Heart to Heart NL. Um, there's multiple other organizations like Quadrangle, for example, that are a great, um, great wealth of knowledge and a great space for people to connect with other people. I just want to say for anyone who is, um, you know, younger, growing up in a small community and is queer, um, you aren't the only one. You really aren't. And there is a whole world out there that's willing to accept you and, and embrace you. So don't ever feel like you're alone because you're not. Really. All right, we have Hanley. Hanley asks, as a visibly trans person who also intersects with other visible minorities, how do you recommend people who have certain privileges that others in the community don't have stand up for others in moments of need and acknowledge the power they hold? Sorry for the spelling, uh, no autocorrect. No worries, I, I understood what you meant. <clears throat> Um, and one thing that we talked about Hanley was the intersecting of oppressions um, in terms of like substance use and being queer. Those are intersecting, intersecting oppressions. Being a queer person and also a visible minority is an intersecting oppression in itself. Um, I myself am a white person, so I do not understand the struggles that black, indigenous um, and other BIPOC queer people have. Um, and I think that recognizing that is very important. Um, I was at a conference the other day and we openly recognized that there wasn't any, if any, Black people there. And it was wondering, where are we missing the mark? How are we not being able to include these people? Um, inclusion means everybody. Inclusion doesn't just mean, you know, we have a queer person here. Okay, you know, that, that mark is checked. We're great. Um, that's tokenization in itself. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think as a white person, um, definitely just acknowledging that other people with intersecting oppressions have it differently and arguably harder um, in a you know, white predominantly country. Okay, we have Luke or Luck, uh, sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, they ask, would you have any tips on dealing with direct homophobia to not only de-escalate a situation, but to even get them more open-minded? Oh. That's a tough question. <laughs> I mean, I'm still dealing with my dad who's homophobic and I'm his son. Like, I thought that was enough to love me kind of thing, right? Um, keep yourself safe, first and foremost, is my, my piece of advice. Um, get out of unsafe spaces and walk away if you're able to. Um, have an ally with you, if possible. Um, present educational materials maybe if the person is like open to that they might not be at all and don't jump into the hate if you can if they're bringing like ammo and they're always shooting like things to hurt you or you know little microaggressions like we talked about you can like, question them and say like why would you say that like where did that come from like i find like the socratic questioning method like not meeting them and building it up just being like, where does that come from why do you think that that makes them have to force and answer what their biases are out loud and a lot of people don't want to do that and that might help you too but i would really say keeping yourself safe and having an ally in educational materials from like katie like k-a-t-i-e that organization or other organizations um, that we're going to bring up some resources later maybe another way to get really good uh peer-reviewed stuff in their face without being you know, a problem. I don't know if that answers it. And if anyone wants any more clarity on the answers that we give, just, just drop it into the chat. Maybe we can readdress them. Yeah. Um, so next we have Tanya and Lori. Um, they say, I am a child and youth care worker and have recently been asked by a child, if I am non-binary, does that mean I am gay? Can you elaborate on how to explain that to a young person? Um, I can touch on this one. Okay. So. Um, to me, and like, to me, sexuality is, is based upon, you know, our own identity. And if somebody is non-binary and their, their sex assigned at birth is male, for example, and they're into men, it doesn't necessarily mean they're gay because their gender identity is something that's not male. Um, for having an identity with sexuality, maybe that person can lean towards gender neutral sexualities like pansexual, for example where gender doesn't really have any um, pointers as to what their gender identity is. 
Yeah, I was gonna like say it, but I'm pansexual, right? I I'm I I didn't know what I was. Like I thought I was straight. I thought I was gay. I thought I was, like I didn't know what I was until somewhat recently. Like when I stopped the hate inside of myself, and I stopped having these biases inside of myself, then I I could meet people as themselves. Like when I stop the hate inside of myself, it lets other people be free and to have fellowship with me if they are working on their biases too. And for me, what it is is yeah, I realized non-binary pansexuality is is where I'm at. It's it's something that's taken a long time and I probably could have been that, that kid that you're talking about. Am I gay? Like, I don't know what's going on. Like, but it's because I was attracted to men that were safe, caring, nice, and had, you know, certain similar things as me. So, uh, yeah, I, I just want to touch on that too. Like that, that kid probably just needs a safe space to explore a lot. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just as a general rule, um, if someone's non-binary, it doesn't mean that they're gay. Um, they can be heterosexual, they could be pansexual. It's based on your own identity and the own, the label that you choose for yourself. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on how like chaotic it can be because of the heteronormative world. Yes, of course. <clears throat> All right, I really appreciate all these questions, by the way. Um, I, I'm so happy that everyone's so engaged in this. So next we have Kent um, and he asks, on the topic of memes, and please understand that this is purely a question to clarify and appease the logical reasoning part of my brain. Yep. Anyway, the meme says, quote, calling yourself non-binary categories categorizes everyone into bin binary or non-binary, creating a binary system which makes you binary again. Um, he also says, I appreciate linguistics and clear communication, so I'm really am aiming for greater understanding. So I guess my question is just what are your thoughts on this meme? Um, um, I personally am not quite sure. Um, this is pretty complex, you know, thinking about binary and non-binary. Um, I just want to say that in our society, typically binary is male or female in terms of gender identity. Um, being non-binary is outside of that realm. So there are people who are non-binary that, you know, thinking of a linear graph, they're in between in terms of being genderqueer. Non-binary could also be outside of that binary, outside of that masculine, feminine, male and female uh, markers. Um, yeah, I, I think that answers, a, yeah. I think it gives a more holistic and organic way of presenting yourself and identifying rather than check boxes, you know what I mean? So. That's the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. All right, we have just a few more questions. Uh, James asks, has Canada been experiencing the shuttering of gay bars? I have found here in Maryland, US, that they are being closed down because according to the LGBTQ plus community, there's not a need for them anymore. I couldn't disagree more, just curious if that is happening there as well. <clears throat> I'm part um, of the community and I know New Brunswick needs more. So I was not consulted for that personally about like the bars closing. I thought like, I don't know about that area, but like we don't have many safe spaces or bars at all in all of New Brunswick to go to. And I personally know people that used to go and drive, unfortunately, and very unfortunately to the gay bars to hurt people. Um, so yeah, we need them. I, I don't think they should be. Unfortunately, they are sometimes being shut down and there's not as many, but I am in complete disagreement that they sh they're they not needed. They're definitely needed. I agree as well. I think having exclusive queer spaces for people to be able to party and connect with others is very important. Here in St. John's, we have one gay bar um, and it's called Velvet. We have another one that's opening up but like me as a person, if I'm going out with my friends and I want to party and let loose type thing, I'm not going to a, a bar that's um, heterosexual or, you know, saying that they're all encompassing of everybody when they're not. I've personally been called slurs because of my outfit that I'm wearing, because I'm wearing makeup. Um, one of my friends got physically attacked um, not too long ago, a couple months ago, just because he was standing outside of a bar um, with his girlfriends and the person just wanted to pick a fight. So it's really important for us to be able to have those queer exclusive spaces for people to be comfortable and just to be safe, you know? Um, James, I'm really sad to hear that um, the community is thinking that these aren't needed because they seriously are, they're very much needed. I have to hide myself again if I don't go to a uh, gay bar. Like I can't dance the same way I dance. I can't like, 
I'm not safe. I, mean, I can't dance with the same partner I want to dance with probably either. You know what I mean? Like, so no, it's, yeah, I think they're needed quite badly. Mm. All right. Next we have Marlene. Marlene asks, could you speak about lateral violence in queer and trans spaces? There is a lot of stigma in our own communities against folks struggling with substance use. For example, I have personally been ostracized. I forgot to mention my chosen name is Marius, still in the process of updating my accounts. Okay, Marius. Um, trying to unpack what that question means. Steve, do you have any, any Can leads you read on it again that? To me? Like I, I'm a person of lived experience with substance use and the queer community. I just want to make sure I'm understanding it before I start speaking. Of course, I can, I can repeat it. Yeah. Could you speak about lateral violence in queer and trans spaces? There is a lot of stigma in our own communities against folks struggling with substance use, for example. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there is. Yeah. Um, just being a substance user in general already puts you in a place of attack from other people. And then also being part of the LGBTQ community adds another layer with some people the heteronormative community. But then with inside the LGBT community, I find, yeah, people who use substances are sometimes vilified. Um, I'm not sure why it is because everyone uses substances um, for the most part. It's just another thing about not being having an awareness beyond yourself. Um, there's tons of like intersecting stigmas that overlap and play against each other. Um, those intersectionalities are something like I'm working at becoming a getting my master's in counseling psychology and they're, they're things I want to really dive deeper into because I have the lived experience on both sides and I don't think there's enough systems and people within those helping trades that really are part of that lived experience and want to look into it, which I think creates, you know, sociologically the what you're saying, the continued lateral, you know, aggressions against each other. Um, I think it exists just again because of personal biases and what is correct for someone. And I also know for myself as a queer person, I got heavily into to substances at the start because I wasn't accepted in any community. Like I had to hide partially in the queer community for using substances, but I also had to hide that I was queer. So substances were the only the only thing that listened authentically without judgment, which I don't know if that's okay to say, but like at that time of my life, I think that's, that was a big part. And I think that that lateral thing happens because people just don't understand and there's a lot of pain hidden. And I think it needs to be talked about and looked at in a systematic sociological way. I don't know if that answers it, but that's, that's how I see it. I think that was a pretty good answer. And Marius, if you want any more clarity or anything, just feel free to drop in the chat and we'll try and get back to you. All right, so next we have Jackie. Um, James made a good point. Again, apologies if I mispronounce your name. What were you saying, Steve? I was just saying James made a very good point. Sorry to interrupt up there. It says, definitely as a person in recovery, um, it's hard to connect with others who are in recovery. And like that's, everyone's recovery is different. Where everyone wants to be is different. And that's, that's a hard thing to see each other. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Definitely, no worries, no worries. All right, so the next question is, as a person who is engaged to a previously gay man who is very confused with his past, how can I help him in his future? <clears throat> um, that is kind of a tough question. Um, everyone is different in their individual sense and the type of help that they want. You know, everyone's in a different path in terms of their own acceptance with their gender and sexuality. Um, I think Jackie, just keeping an open mind and having those spaces and avenues for you to allow um, your partner to open up about their experiences. Just being that supportive ear, even just being an ear or a shoulder um, can be really helpful. And that's just my, my opinion on that. All right, potentially the last question, but certainly not the, late, the least. Um, Marissa asks, what can queer people do to try and make their workplace more aware of pronouns and queer inclusivity? I often feel like every time I go to work at the NS Health Authority that I have to come out to every person I work with and I'm constantly reminding coworkers of my pronouns despite the fact that I wear pronoun pins. Is it really my duty to teach inclusivity and pronouns to people in healthcare who should be aware of this anyways? I think, um, go ahead if you wanna go for it. Um, yeah, I just want to say that, Marissa, I understand. <laughs> I have went through the struggles of, you know, trying to get people to use their pronouns, um, giving pronoun reminders and things like that. 
Um, and if your pronouns aren't he, him, or she, her, if they're they, them, for example, it usually comes with questions afterwards. And I recognize that it can be really exhausting to continuously educate people, especially in spaces where you're not ready to be educating people. Like Steve and myself here today, we're ready. We're here to answer questions. This is the place to be to ask those questions because we want to. We have the space, we have the emotional capacity to be able to do that. Um, it can be really exhausting, like I said, to be walking down the street or at work, you know, and you're juggling a bunch of things. And then someone's asking, well, why are your pronouns this? Um, people need to be a little more mindful that not every queer person is just going to answer every single question that you have about their own identity, as well as the general information around pronouns and, and identities. But uh, yeah, um, I don't think it's necessarily your duty to teach inclusivity, but definitely when you can, when you have the space to, to do as much as you need to. Um, you, don't owe, you don't owe anybody an explanation for your own identity. Did you want to touch on that, Steve? I just think that's also up to the organization you work for to have better education policies, programming, and back you up on stuff too. And just having more people with lived experience and of uh, the community and positions of power where they're not tokenized and they're actually listened to and have some sort of ability to make reforms, then that helps a lot too. All right, um, I think that's it for the questions. Um, I do see some messages in the chat and we'll try and get back to those in, in a moment. Um, maybe I'll just do a quick look just before we end things to see if there's anything that people wanted some clarity on. Um, Carolyn, Katie, or Steve, let me know if uh, you notice anything that somebody was asking a question. No, I just hope that we get better at you know, not stigmatizing people, meeting people where they're at, and letting them have the agency to be themselves because that's where allyship is, which is that's a, the magic of the world. And capital of the world to me is care, and that's what creates community. I just think it's all possible if we're all in it. Of course. Um, I do want to just highlight something that Hanley said. This is, an, I think it's a really great analogy. Um, Hanley says, to the linguistic things, think of it like this. We are all given the choice between apple and orange at the store. It's all they sell. Uh, someone, people decided to start growing other things that are not apples or oranges. They call themselves farmers and the people who get apples and oranges, shoppers. Sorry, I'm trying to scroll without losing it. Um, this means that yes, there are two options, but those words are just umbrellas for many other options. So the farmers, non-binary people in this case, may have carrots or grapes. Um, demi boys, gender queer, even the shoppers could be binary gender, are made up of two groups, apples and oranges, men and women. Yeah, so it's very much um, the things that we're given um, in this society. A lot of people just fluctuate between male and female or think that it's just male and female. We are multifaceted people. We all have difference in our perspectives and our own identities and things. And just having an open mind around um, identities that don't align with the things that you understand is really important. Yeah, identifying where your fears come from too. Like if, if you're somebody that's, you know, if something tingles a bias, there's always usually a reason. It's good to try to find the other reason. Right. Um, we do have another question come in from Samantha, who uses she, her pronouns. May you please give some examples of gender neutral examples for things that are typically gendered, such as how to describe a person who may present as a typical female or male? I apologize if this is a confusing question. Samantha, I don't think it's a confusing question. Um, I personally like to gravitate towards gender neutral um, verbiage. Um, for example, if we were to introduce, say, ladies and gentlemen, you know, say everyone in the room or you know, attendees, using that language that doesn't necessarily point towards somebody possessing a certain gender identity is important. Um, and just being aware of the things that are gendered, you know, there, there's a lot of things that are gendered. For example, in Newfoundland, I don't know if this is a, a thing across the board in Canada, but people talk about their cars with she, her pronouns. And I find that so strange. Yeah. <laughs> I think it like perpetuates the objectifying the objectification of women um, in terms of them being machines or something. But yeah, that's, you know, there's no need to call your car a she. Your car is a machine. Use a they, them pronoun or it or something, right? It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't need to have a gender, that type of thing. So I hope that answers your question, Samantha. All right. 
Um, I just want to talk about a few resources first before we end everything. Um, so the three organizations that I have here, EGAL Canada, they are incredible. Um, I have presented at, I presented there before up in Toronto. Um, and they're mostly around social justice and queer legislation. They're an incredible resource for information and also to reach out to in terms of, you know, what can you do in your community type deal. Um, somebody asked me earlier um, what they could do for young queer people or what that young queer person could do in terms of creating a connection. PFLAG is definitely one of those. They're a national organization that supports queer people and their families in terms of just supporting them for being queer, um, helping them with events, helping them create connections and networks with people. So just to back things up, PFLAG would be an incredible resource for that. I know that there's PFLAG in Newfoundland. I assume and I hope that there is PFLAG in all the other provinces as well. And last, of course, is the Trans Lifeline. This is a very uh, useful one for anyone who is um, trans or gender non-binary. Um, and the lifeline's right there. It's 1-877-565-8860. And from my understanding, they are peer-led. They are run by trans people. And they are a great resource for people who have any questions or concerns or just I want to be able to vent about their, their experiences. <clears throat> All right, next we have a few other things, um, just as little reminders and also little tips for us to be more inclusive. Um, put your friend's pronouns in your phone. Um, if somebody, it's, it's just a great thing to do. Um, a lot of my friends understand that I use they, them pronouns and whenever they use them, I feel I feel great. It makes me feel like I'm being seen and heard. <clears throat> um, Steve, do you want to touch on the other ones? I know you had written these out. That's okay. Um, which one we're we on? Check your privilege. Sorry. Um, we're on ally as a verb. If we're going. Ally as a verb is a. I like cares like verb. Everything as a verb should be an action. You know what I mean? Like caring for somebody isn't just like a place holding one time thing. It's not a validation. It's not a feather in your cap. Um, ally isn't a placeholder thing. It's a place you hold for someone else. Being an ally is an action. Uh, that means you're gonna have to take actions to be with the other person. Actions beyond yourself to help you listen with love. Um, checking your privilege is huge. I mean, yeah, I've had a lot of systematic help, but the system hasn't helped me sometimes, but I still know that, you know, I live in a country where I have more resources and more abilities. Doesn't mean that there's still not terrible things happening, but like one of my friends, lives in a country where it's illegal for him to be gay. And we're trying to get him on through an organization called Rainbow Railroad to basically get out of their country so they can have a life. And that's terrifyingly scary. Um, confront your own prejudices and unconscious biases. If you feel something tingling or you see a meme that really, really inflames you, like take a step back and like maybe look where it came from. It might've came from Turning Point USA or like a far right group and they've just really worked at putting the linguistics together to make you really upset. Um, and know that you will mess up sometimes. Like you might mess up a pronoun or something like that. It matters a lot, but breathe, apologize and just ask for guidance. I mean, just knowing somebody cares to listen to me and love me outside the heteronormative experience is so healing and so beautiful. Like, thank you for realizing I exist and like seeing through like the whole picture that's been put in front of me to see me in it. Like that's when somebody sees me in the picture and sees me for me, I'm sorry, you've gained your new best friend. Like I'm not going to leave you. <laughs> like this is really cool to have that feeling. So yeah. Anyways, that's me. Ask a queer. We're okay. I promise. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, that concludes our presentation for today. Thank you again for joining here and listening to our perspectives and offering such amazing words of support. Um, it really made me feel very more comfortable about doing this. Sharing lived experience stories can be difficult at times, but I feel like I'm in a room full of supportive people and I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for that. Um, if anyone wants to connect with us, um, we dropped our emails down, Steve and I. If anyone wants to connect about sooner, um, Katie, if you have the link, could you drop our newsletter, please? <clears throat> and yeah, we look forward to uh, chatting with some of you. And I hope that all of you could take something away from this presentation today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate all the words of support.